Hello, and welcome to the EDH RecCast. My name is Joey Schultz, and I'm joined, as always, by my fantastic co-hosts. Up first, he just gained control of someone's Tron land, and he told them Urza's mine. That's Matt Morgan. So an interview recently asked me to describe myself in three words or less, and I just said, not good at counting. <laughs> <laughs> That did not go where I expected it to, but I really like that, Matt. Uh, that's really funny. I love it. Well, and then they asked me to explain the gap in my resume, and I just said, well, I hit enter after each of my jobs. Ah! <laughs> Matt, that's, you're a treasure. Please, please I, never You change. might say I excel at workplace jokes. <laughs> yes, I would say that even, even without the entendre there. That's really <laughs> great. Up next, he knelt down to get a box of Kamigawa, but he accidentally put his knee on Neon Dynasty. That's Dana Roach. Uh, what do you call a pencil with two erasers? Uh, inefficient is the first word that comes to mind, but I'd love to know, Dana. What is it? I mean, it's it, the joke's pointless. It's pointless. There it is. <laughs> there it is. That, that actually wasn't, that, is... that, that wasn't my first choice. It was number two. Because <laughs> of uh, that's the Mr. deep cut everyone's here for. <laughs> Dixon Ticonderoga number two pencil <laughs> references are not what I had on my 2022 bingo sheet, but uh, well done, Dana. <laughs> anyway, this is the EDH Reccast. EDH Rec is the best deck building resource on the web for the commander format, compiling data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new commander decks. And here on the podcast, what we like to do is give all of that data a little more context. Matt, can you tell us? what it is that we're talking about in this week's episode. This week, we are going to talk about all of the powerhouse commons, all these great commonly found cards, you might say, uh, that we often put into our decks. Yeah, for sure. In EDH, I feel like we always focus on big, splashy rares, but let's give some love to some of those common cards in our commander decks, because sometimes those are the real powerhouses. Real quick, before we get into our main show, let's pause and thank our sponsors for the show. Dana, take it away. The EDH Recast is sponsored by Card Kingdom and TCG Player. Buying from them is like playing Simic, and <laughs> buying from anyone else is like playing Boros. Oh, wow! Just go to EDH Rec and click on the card in question. Go to the vendor link down below. Doing so supports both the site and the show. And if you'd prefer to support the show directly, you can do so over at patreon.com slash EDH We have patron tiers of all sorts of levels, and it's just a great way to get yourself some extra perks while supporting the show, whether you want to join the Discord community that we have, whether you want to see all the episodes a day early, we have early access channels there as well. There's all these perks you can get for yourself and more over at patreon.com slash EDH Even the prestigious weekly shout out, which we're going to give <laughs> this week to Matt Vanderveen, uh, one of the most powerful names in all of the world and maybe even like a top three last name. So that the Vanderveen is just I, that's a great name to say. So thank you so much for your support, Matt. We definitely appreciate it. And shout out to a fellow Matt. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Matt. That was darling. You're that welcome was and you're welcome. Oh man, that's great. And also, before we get into our main topic, we also have one other uh, thing that we should uh, check off the list real quick here too. So folks who've been watching the YouTube version of these episodes may have noticed that the set behind me has been a little different the past couple episodes and that it maybe possibly might kind of resemble the set at the Command Zone podcast. So yeah, let's explain that real quick. Um, so we have had an absolutely terrific two years working with the Command Zone where they have handled the post-production on the show. And it was always the plan for me to learn the ropes and learn to take over the post-production part for the EDHREC cast. But you know, at around at some point in the in the distant past the funniest thing happened that um may have shut the whole world down for a while and kind of always put those plans on hold but things have finally recently worked out so i have been here in la learning the ropes and joining me has been our friend chase aka mana curves who has recently joined the edh Rec team so chase and i will now be producing the show together as well as all of the other fantastic content that you can find on our edh Recast youtube channel it has been an absolute blast for us to learn video editing and production techniques from these absolute top tier professionals and we're so excited to carry those lessons into our future content and to bring you the same high quality show that you love. Yeah, we definitely appreciate the Command Zone and all of their just enormous help continuing our show and developing. Uh, this isn't a goodbye by any means. We still love them. Uh, 
a fantastic crew over there, whether it's uh, the producers, the background people you never really get to see or talk to. They're all fantastic. We appreciate all of their help. This is definitely not a goodbye. It's just a shift in our relationship, and we definitely still value them so much. They're great for the community, and uh, if anybody out there needs some help with their podcast, they are definitely an amazing resource. So thank you so much to the Command Zone. We appreciate all of your help over the past few years, and we look forward to uh, what we're able to, to bring from those lessons. Yeah, I mean, this has been an amazing experience working with them for sure. Um, and fortunately, Matt and I will make this really easy for Joey. We kind of do it all in one take, the two of us. Um, so it, it'll be very easy for, for Chase and Joey to pick this up, I think. Yeah, it's totally just one take. <laughs> I mean, we don't do anything at all to make you look as pro and on it as you are. I mean, it, it's... The, the amount of work it must take to make Matt and I look like professionals boggles my mind. Yeah, there's there, it really it's <laughs> nothing. We we barely do anything at all. Like, well, all the work that you do do, whatever it is, um, all the wizardry that you do, we we appreciate it and thank you just so much for everything, yes. all the help you've been over the past few years. Oh, it's it's honestly been a pleasure to work with all of you and get a little peek behind the scenes to every episode. You all are so delightful and I really enjoy the show. I know we all do and we are so happy to see you all continue to grow and be able to do something like this. So uh, thank you for allowing us to be a part of this with you. Thank you. And, and, and thank you. Yeah, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you and just the entire crew over there. You guys have been so helpful and we just, yeah, can't say enough how much we appreciate it. All right. Well, I guess this is our final send off. So I will see you all later and maybe on a stream or two. That would be lovely. Bye. Bye. Oh, what a terrific goodbye from Ashlyn. Thank you so much. It's been such a treat. Oh, I'm yay. Yay. That was, well, that was awesome. I'm really I, excited. It's going to be so awesome. Actually, Joey, can I make a request? Can we have Ashlyn come back on? Uh, she's way more fun just between mm. Dana and I. Um, call me Matthew. crazy. Matthew, what? I might have to replace you with Matt Vanderveen <laughs> if that's the, the route that we're taking. He's, he's got a power name. It makes sense. Power name, power name. <laughs> All right, yeah. So thanks so much. That was a, uh, a terrific one to let everyone know what's going on there. It's a really exciting announcement, and we so look forward to this future. But for now, let's get into our episode. Let's get to talking about those powerhouse commons, the amazing cards that we are playing in EDH, even though they're just a little, it's a black or a white set symbol. It's not the rares. These are still cards that like can sometimes overshadow the rares that actually end up in your deck. And Matt, I got to say, I think this episode was really inspired by you and a whole bunch of your challenge the stats picks because because you've been challenging cards like Reckless Impulse and other cards like that that are from these recent sets that can kind of get overlooked, but they really shouldn't be because even though they're just commons, they do a bunch of work. And these are always the easiest cards to get overlooked during preview season. And you circle back, you're sorting through bulk, you're like, oh, that card actually does do a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> I love these types of cards. Uh, there's always some really interesting budget builds out there. Uh, people make the uh, popper commander decks where everything in there is a, a common or an uncommon. There's all sorts of different ways. And just even in a typical deck uh, with no restrictions, you can find some very powerful upgrades from playing cards like Defile that I challenged before. Oh, yeah. Or Reckless Impulse, like you said. There's all sorts of great ways to fit in little power bumps, these little incremental value pieces um, in these common and uncommons. Yeah, for sure, Matt. You really love challenging those because you're right. It is so easy to overlook them, especially amidst all of the deluge of product. So let's give some love to some of those. And first, I think we should probably get our bearings to understand what are the most popular commons that show up in uh, Commander. Let's take a look at the numbers just to see where the field is currently at. And naturally, if we're going to be looking at the most popular commons, we'll obviously start off with the classics. So cards like Command Tower, Arcane Signet, Evolving Wilds, Terramorphic Expanse, these are hugely popular because they can go in any number of decks. And if you're watching the YouTube version of this video, you might notice a fun number there on these uh, on these cards and how many decks they can go into. Yeah, we've hit over a million decks of recently on EDH Rec. We've got so much going on in our database and these common cards show up in just tons of cards across that million. So a couple of milestones on this episode, which I'm really happy about. But you know, the classics, Command Tower, Arcane Signet, whole bunch of those that show up just everywhere and are amazing role fillers for the format. Yeah, and they're also ones that that have tended to show up in precon decks too. <laughs> right. So you, you, not only are they both affordable and readily available, there's a bit of the um, precon effect at work as well for these. As people get them in their decks and just kind of leave them in as well. So 
Um, they're popular and they're, there's just a ton of reasons why they keep showing up in lists. Yeah, it turns out that some of the most popular cards in the format, when you put them into as many pre-cons as possible, which I'm glad to see, <laughs> you know, as a recent development, Arcane Signet is no longer a $10, $20 card. It's much, much more affordable. Uh, all these commons and uncommons turns out just because they can go in pretty much any deck, people are putting them in pretty much any deck, which is a very good move. They're just incredibly powerful. Uh, Commands Tower, one of the most powerful lands in the entire format because literally whatever color you need in your deck, it's going to make. And that's just <laughs> fantastic start for any mana base, except for maybe one color, but eh, it happens. Uh, you know, that happens. And, and yeah, it's especially... There's no there's no perfect magic card is what we're saying. There you go. That's actually where I was going to go with it. Like some of these are ubiquitous, but not always um, in, in terrible ways. These are really just small roll fillers, and that's nice to see. Um, I think it's especially interesting to note that there are some cards that like you wouldn't really think of them being as common but like technically they did appear at common uh when they first arrived and that does influence a lot of their availability that can also just be really helpful to, to i just remember their power because it isn't just a common like thought vessel is really the card that i'm thinking of here the two mana mana rock is technically a common it showed up in uh commander precons and then eventually i think later on in uh commander legends if i'm remembering that correctly but like thought vessel also just a common that is a nice mana rock gives you an infinite hand size that thing's a total powerhouse and there have even been some other cards like mindstone that have seen printings at common as well and those are really great role fillers but the thing that really just amazes me is that technically there are some cards in the format that also appeared at common like when they were first printed such as Ristic Study and Ashnod's Altar and I think Mystic Remora as well. So some of these actual genuine powerhouse cards that pervade the format, possibly even in problematic ways, actually do like those were technically considered commons uh, when they were printed. So yeah, those are like this is how good these cards are, y'all. In the case of Mystic Remora, not even when they were first printed, when it was only printed. That that cards only had one printing. <laughs> back in 1995. So I guess that's kind of the equivalent of a mythic today. I, I suppose so. Yeah, I, I, I would I would argue there's as many Mystic Remoras out there as any modern set mythic out there. there <laughs> you mean probably, it's, it's kind yeah. of misleading to say, right. um, considering like th those sets were not printed nearly as much. Like there's probably more secret layers out there than there are Mystic Remoras. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. Like, and, like actual secret layer releases, not just like the individual drops, but like- Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, like the entire sets, yeah. Yeah, it's just, I feel like that's where we can find like so much of the stuff we'll be talking about in this episode. Because uh, some of those are just, they, they are really, really spicy. I see. And like you, if they were to be reprinted today, yeah, a, a common set symbol is probably not the thing that we would actually be seeing on those cards' rarity symbols. Um, also, for reference, let's briefly go through some of the colors just to again get our bearings. Like Matt, what are some of the most popular green commons that we see in the format, and do they have a specific theme or anything in common with each other? Um, they certainly do have a theme recurring with them. Um, besides the fact that they're green, of course, um, that's it's kind of a no-brainer <laughs> here. Um, but the most commonly played common card in green is going to be Cultivate, which was printed in um, numerous mainline sets, but also has made its way into many, many pre-cons as well. Um, but Cultivate is going to be that card. It's one of the staples of green ramp. It's three mana for a sorcery. Grab two basics, put one on the battlefield, one into your hand. Uh, it's just a powerful, powerful effect. And there's a reason why this is the most played common, because it outpaces even a lot of rares and mythics, because it's just such a great effect that you want <laughs> in so many different decks. It gets you ramp. It gets you your colors that you need. It's, it does a whole lot of things that you just want to be doing in any given game. Uh, that's why it's showing up in over 232,000 decks. Not 232 decks, like Dana would <laughs> probably point out. Uh, 232,000 decks. I mean, yeah, it, it's insane how many decks that Cultivate shows up in. And, and then you just go down the list for green cards here. It's just all <laughs> ramp spells. It's Kadama's Reach. It's Rampant Growth. It's Sakura Tribe Elder. It's basically a list of the cards that you would consider staples in green. For the most part, are all commons. Yeah, green has such a huge density of them here. Um, also of note, like there isn't just mana here. There's also a nature's claim, which is a nice little instant that destroys an artifact or enchantment and gives its controller for life, which you don't mind because you just destroyed something for one mana. That also sees a bunch of play. But generally speaking, green has the common game kind of on lock. They're doing extremely well for themselves. And the same is also true for blue. Blue has such staples as 
counterspell and brainstorm and ponder and negate like blue is also seeing cards that show up in 200,000 decks or so blue is also like it's got the common game unlock especially because so many of those small cantrips that just immediately refill your hand with the you know ponder you'll draw a card off of it brainstorm you'll get some card advantage from that there like yeah blue's common game also really really excellent a lot of stuff that's going to grease the wheels of your deck there and both of those types of effects that we just talked about between counter spells and in getting some card advantage or cantrip they're just kind of calling cards of what all these typical colors do. Mm. Uh, green gets ramp, and it's just very, very commonly played. Blue does blue things, whether it's stopping people from doing something or finding more ways to stop people from doing something. <laughs> uh, it's just, yeah, these things that you're seeing at all these common slots, they kind of are really good signposts at what each individual color does. Very much. Yeah, very much. Moving into black, we're also seeing slightly lower numbers for some of these, but like still very important numbers, I would say. For example, like Feed the Swarm is a recent black common that has skyrocketed in popularity, already showing up in 65,000 decks. And that is the black sorcery that can finally let black kill off enchantments. Costs a little bit of life to do it, but man, that is so worth it. And then as long as we're talking about black, I mean, some of my favorite black cards are also commons, such as Viscera Seer to let me sacrifice my stuff, or an amazing win condition, Grey Merchant of Asphodel to drain life from opponents. Like, again, this is what we're talking about when it's just these commons and how good they are. Grey Merchant As of Asphodel is like one of my absolute best win conditions in my Marin of Clan Neltoth deck. Like, these cards are so dang good. These are some of the things that I specifically tutor up before I'll find other rares. These cards are phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, Read the Bones, one of my favorite spells ever printed in, in, in black. <laughs> a common, and it's in a gazillion decks showing up as, as one of the kind of premier commons in the format for black. And I would also argue Grey Merchant of Asphodel, just because you're able to just dome the table, probably has won more games than any other common out in the format. Uh, yeah, probably. Just single-handedly. Like, oops, oops, I came around and uh, I won. <laughs> Honestly, that's pretty fair. Matt, what about red? Let's move away from those big three colors that we know, but like moving into red and then later to white, what are we seeing for the color red in terms of its common cards that are commonly played in EDH? Well, red has some fairly good uh, card selection spells as well. There's Faithless Looting and Thrill of Possibility, hmm. two great looting effects, uh, as Faithless Looting would lead you to believe. Um, able to get some card selection, fill up that graveyard for whatever graveyard shenanigans you might have. Um, those are just leading the pack right there. So with Faithless Looting showing up in over 93,000 decks, it just shows how powerful and how desirable that effect is. But then after those two cards, you're also seeing Red Elemental Blast and Pyroblast, which... Turns out red has counter spells too, um, just to counter the other counter spells. But you know, <laughs> it's also a very, very powerful effect that a lot of people I think forget even was common in the first place. Me, me, I'm one of those people. I completely forgot that the the red elemental and the pyroblasts were, were were common cards. I think one of them did see a printing that was at uncommon. But yeah, those cards are so good, so absolutely like I've th those have been some of the most amazing like whoa type of moments in gameplay for me is when you use one of those to counter a cyclonic rift, for example. Like, I, I love those, and I am surprised to see them being among the top played common red cards in the format. Well, what's really interesting, too, is a trend that kind of continues here. More than a few of these commons that really show up heavily in EDH are also so powerful they're banned or restricted in eternal formats. Oh. Uh, things like Faithless Looting and, and going back to Dark Ritual or Brainstorm or Ponder. Um, these cards aren't just, like, really good in EDH. They're powerful enough to actually impact eternal formats and have had to be controlled there. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's just kind of fascinating to see the, the, some of the names on this list for the colors that aren't white. Yeah, I was going to ah. say, let, let's continue talking about bannably <laughs> powerful commons and move into white. <laughs> But then um, I realized something. Yeah. So this, uh, we we didn't want to find this. It's just like when we were looking <laughs> right. through these, this is just, these are the numbers that we found that, yeah, the most popular white common card in the format turns out to be Soul Warden, which is admittedly a really good card. One mana, one, one in white. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield un under anyone's control, you'll gain a life. Like that's actually a really awesome card and it shows up in 23,000 decks. But like note already the difference in statistics there. We're talking about the most popular white common card shows up in 23,000. 
3,000 as opposed to Cultivate was showing up in 230, <laughs> 200,000 <laughs> or even literally, when, t- literally 10% of decks. Uh, right. Or like even when we were talking about red, like Faithless Looting was showing up in, in still 93,000. Like this is a good white card for sure, but it's also it, it belongs to a certain strategy. And the next most popular white card uh, at common is Ephemerate, which is a blink card. So interesting thing that we see about white is that it doesn't seem to have a lot of common cards that suit all types of strategies, regardless of whatever your uh, your specific deck is going to be doing. The most popular cards do fit into a specific strategy, such as life gain or such as a blink deck, that kind of thing. Um, the closest that we could probably say is a white card that fits into multiple types of strategies um, that is showing up popularly for white cards at common is the card Oblivion Ring. Um, but I have thoughts about that. I don't. I don't think people. I don't think that should be a popular white common card in this format. I don't think Oblivion Ring is very good in EDH. So um, I just want to see some changes here. I'm sad at the numbers of that we found, but I hope they change in the future. I mean, uh, Oblivion Ring, as well as Ephemerate and Soul Warden, don't quite seem like they're in the same class as Great Merchant or Dark Ritual or yes. Counter Spell or Brainstorm. So yes, I, I think uh, yeah. one of these things is a little bit not like the other. I had to scroll through almost 140 of the most popular common cards in the entire format before I found a white card. And that makes me sad. <laughs> that is a thing that makes me sad. And I don't like it very much. Um, but, you know, I'm again hopeful that it uh, sticks out in the future and that things will will shift around. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot that you can discover about EDH and its principles, I think, by observing the things at the common rarity and not just at the rare rarity. Um, and, and this actually does make me kind of want to also get into a fun new statistic here of us examining what is the deck that plays the most commons? What is the deck that plays the least number of common cards? Um, Matt, do you think you would have had a guess about which strategies or which specific commander would play the most commons in their deck? Um, I I would say just because I had once a Spellslinger Shu Yu in the Silent Tempest deck that had a lot of combat tricks in it because I want to be able to activate the prowess ability and all that kind of fun stuff. So anything with a lot of combat tricks in there, whether it's Titan Strength or, or uh, brute force, anything that just gives a little combat pump, uh, that might be something. So probably a probably a fair amount of red decks. Uh, maybe I would even say some blue, just knowing how powerful ponder, <laughs> preordain, brainstorm are. All right, makes sense, Dana. I, I would have guessed the number one and number three as being somewhere in the top three or four. I wouldn't have guessed uh, number two, which is Adelaide's the Cinder Wind. Um, I would have Zada, Hedron Grinder, and Feather would have been my number two guesses. Just having played against those decks and seeing they just tend to run cards that you always have to say, that does what now? <laughs> it, it's they're, it's they're, they're filled with commons that do a not necessarily that amazing thing that tends to draw you a card or be very powerful in the aggregate. So um, that I wasn't surprised about those two, but the Adelaide's one kind of caught me off guard. Yes, yeah. So Zada at number one, which plays an average of 40 commons in the typical Zada deck. Uh, Adelie's at number two, which is the wizard that pumps up all of your wizards whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell. That plays 34 commons on average. And then, as you noted, Feather in the number three spot plays 33 commons on average. And you're right, they tend to play a bunch of these small cards that will do actually a bunch of work because you are spreading them out over the course of either several turns or across an entire army. But I will confess to you guys that I actually tricked you with this question because those are the answers, but they're also technically not the answers because the real answer is any deck that uses Persistent Petitioners, which you can have any number of copies of in your deck, or Rat Colony, or Dragon's Approach. So those are technically the real answers because you're not going to play just one. You're going to play like easily 33 of those specific common cards when you're playing that strategy. So haha, trick ya. They're definitely the Pringles of decks. You can't have just one. Uh, I, w- I would say that the Pringles of decks are actually Commander Legends foils. But that's just me. <laughs> fair point. Uh, that's a fair point. Can, can confirm. Can confirm. Can confirm. Yeah. Maybe the pistachios. You can't just have one. Would, would that be better, Dana? <laughs> that, I'll, I'll work for that. Um, we're thinking about getting <laughs> pistachios as our new sponsor anyway. So um, <laughs> pistachios, they're green. <laughs> They're green, like Cultivate. Uh, anyway, let's move on now to the inverse of that question. Those were the commanders that play the greatest number of commons, but... Uh, again, I didn't want to find out this information, but when we looked through the numbers of the uh, the commanders that played the least number of commons, basically anything that's mono white, <laughs> sort of like we saw before, big stats here, but like there are nearly 1,000 Avacyn Angel of Hope decks, and on average, they contain one common card in them. <laughs> or uh, there are 800-ish Elish Norn decks, and they play an average of 
two common cards in them. Um, so yeah, it just seems that there aren't currently a lot of good uh, white commons to pump up those types of numbers. I, again, hope that that changes. But yeah, just uh, a funny thing that we can see, I think, about the health of the format does seem to also be impacted quite a lot by the cards that we see just at that single base rarity, you know? Now, I would argue for mono white, at least, if we open this up to uncommon specifically, uh, still excluding rares and mythic rares, I think white would do much, much mm. better because there's a just so, so large amount of powerful uncommons, whether it's Swords of Plowshares and Path to Exile. Those two are some of the most played cards in the format, not just at <laughs> Uncommon. Uh, I think white would do much, much better if we open it up to Uncommon, but since we are only looking at common specifically, yes, white definitely is lacking here. I, I really appreciate that. That's a good observation, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, because the the rares and the uncommons, it's not like they don't matter completely. Um, and there are certainly some extremely spicy ones. And I'm also excited to see tons more spicy ones in the future. Based off of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, there's a lot of spicy stuff happening at Wizards of the Coast. So like, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see what all of that goes on. Uh, but that was just us getting our bearings, understanding where things currently are in the format as they sit. But really, I think the thing that we're most excited to talk about in this episode is going to be our personal favorite favorite commons. What are the commons that we are playing in our decks that sometimes overshadow even the mythics we're playing in our decks? And I think what we will have to do is actually save that for after we do challenge the stats, because it's one of our favorite segments on the podcast. We love to challenge all of those stats because there's so many of them on the website, but we don't always agree with them. Sometimes we think that cards see too much or too little play. So we love to challenge those statistics. Dana, do you mind starting us off this week? What's your challenge? My challenge is for a uh, card that's not not a common. I should have I should have stayed on theme. I didn't. I went with an uncommon here. <gasps> How could you? Um, War Cadence printed way back in Mercadian Masks, and it's had one reprinting in Commander 2013. It's an enchantment for two and a red, um, and has activated ability for X and red. This turn, creatures can't block unless their controller pays X for each blocking creature they control. So it's a way to force through combat damage in red without having to rely on trample. You can just make your stuff unblockable. What's really nice about War Cadence, though, is it's not restricted to creatures you control. Um, if you have an enchantment that grants trample or something, that's just going to allow you to poke through damage. And your opponents, if they have big, beefy blockers, they can still soak up a chunk of that. War Cadence not only lets you poke your guys through, if someone else is swinging at one of your opponents and you want to allow their creatures to get through, you can activate Ward Cadence and <laughs> make it so their creatures are more or less unblockable unless your opponent spends way, way too much mana. It's currently only in about 1,500 decks in ADH rec, and I think there are a lot of different mono-red combat-based decks that could really use an opportunity to both punch damage through with a bunch of unblockable creatures and play some political games with giving their opponent's creatures unblockable. Yeah, Dana, love that you picked this. Um... Correct me if I'm wrong, but the last time that you played War Cadence, did you or did you not use it when Matt was attacking me, even though you weren't involved in that combat step at all, um, just to make sure that I couldn't block Matt's onslaught of creatures? Was I can that that neither really confirm do? nor deny any shenanigans that may have occurred with a War Cadence in place, but yes, that definitely happened, and I will confirm <laughs> and not deny mm. that that did occur. I will step in and confirm, actually, that that did happen. <laughs> so yes, over at twitch.tv slash EDHRETCAST, by the way. So, so this isn't um, just a that theory. This is a confirmed <laughs> lab tested card that we have for our listeners benefit verified in fact <laughs> successfully challenged two thumbs up. Oh yeah. Oh and it's and I, I love you so much for doing that to me man. I'm not bitter <laughs> Go at team. all. I promise. <laughs> No, that is such a, a great trick, like messing around with other people's combat steps. It's something that you're quickly becoming a master at, and I need to be afraid, not even when you move to combat, I need to be afraid when anyone else moves to combat because of you. And that is a wild position for you to have adapted into, my dude. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'm just, anyway, you know, Matt, just trying to keep everyone on their toes. Yeah, indeed you are. Matt, how about you tell us about your challenge this week? So my challenge this week is for one of these new Kamigawa Neon Dynasty legendary creatures. Now I know it had, the set hasn't been out for very long, but we actually have a huge amount of data already on Ashin Two Heavens as one. There's over 2,000 decks so far, which is more than we've 
can say for a lot of commanders that we talk about here. Mm. Uh, so for those of you not in the know, Ashin Two Heavens as One is the Mardu, so a red, a white, and a black for a 3-4 legendary human samurai whose ability says if a creature attacking causes a triggered ability of a permit you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. Now, 2,000 decks is nothing to shake your head at. And there actually is a common that I really do like in Audacious Thief because you get to double the draw triggers. But Yay. there's an uncommon, actually, that I really think folks should be giving a second look at. And that is Campaign of Vengeance. So Campaign of Vengeance is three in Orzhov, so a white and a black for an enchantment that says, whenever a creature you control attacks, defending player loses one life and you gain one life. Now, this happens for every creature that you control attacking. So if you attack with five creatures, the defending player loses five life and you gain five life. So with a sheen out in play, that then doubles to 10. So you're draining somebody for 10 just for attacking with five creatures. That is such a powerful stacking effect. And folks, only 17% of the Ashin decks out there are including Campaign of Vengeance. And I think this should absolutely be one of the first enchantments you look at, especially when you consider some of the enchantments that are getting, getting played more don't really do a whole lot with Ashin. Like Brave the Sands, that doesn't really do a whole lot for you. And it's not helping Ashin specifically where Campaign of Vengeance definitely does. So... If you're looking for a uncommon way to power up your deck, uh, this is a fantastic way to do it. I love Campaign of Vengeance. I think Ashin is a perfect place for it. And the card is a quarter. <laughs> you can get such an, a huge amount of power for such a cheap card. I absolutely love it. So Ashin players out there, give Campaign of Vengeance a second look. That's really gnarly. Well done. That's... Ooh, that's I'm I'm afraid again. I'm afraid of your combat step. Even without Dana involved, it turns out I should still just be regularly afraid of Matt's combat step. You, you don't, I don't need Dana's help, but I do appreciate it. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Uh, I'm going to move on now to our listener submitted challenge. And this one actually comes to us from Scott Cullen at Savantir. Um, you may know him from the BM cast, which is super fun to listen to. Him and Emma do an amazing job. So you definitely should go and check them out. Um, we recently played with Scott and Emma on a stream twitch.tv slash edhretcast and scott pulled out a synergy that d blew all of our minds and we do need to like use this moment to talk about it a little bit more so scott has a mono red lalia the blade reforged deck which is that three mana two two spirit warrior with haste whenever it attacks you exile the top card of your library and you can play that card this turn and whenever you exile one or more cards from your library and or your graveyard you put a plus one counter onto lalia and this effect is like actually pretty darn bonkers already. But specifically, Scott said that he'd been talking to a lot of judges, like high up all as far as he could go up the chain for the judges uh, and folks who are like rules managers at Wizards of the Coast, even to make sure that the way that Lelia works with Cascade is the way that he thinks it works with Cascade. Because when you cast a spell with Cascade, you'll exile cards from the top of your library until you find a card that costs less mana and you'll be able to cast it. And Scott was like, wait, do each of those cards go into exile one at a time or does this all count as a single exile effect for Lelia. Would it get a bazillion plus one counters if I were to cascade with a bunch of different things, say, for example, the card Volcanic Torrent? Um, turns out, according to Scott and according to the judges that Scott has talked to, yes. It turns out that, yes, Cascade is actually going to work counting each of those cards individually going into exile and giving Lelia just a bazillion, bazillion, bazillion plus one counters. And I was very swiftly taught that lesson in a combat step. It seems like there's a recurring theme of Joey being attacked by a bunch of amazing stuff recently. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to use this moment to shout out. That is a delicious energy that I don't think is very apparent to everyone. And if you are playing Lelia, it's probably worth it to take a look at these. Volcanic Torrent only shows up in about 19% of Lelia decks so far. There are a bunch of other Cascade cards that you could be using. I think there's even a red common Cascade card that you might want to consider putting into Lelia just because of how good this stuff is. So uh, yeah, Scott, kudos to you. And Matt and Dana, I'm afraid of your combat steps and I hope that these types of synergies will be the kind of thing that I can use to fight back against you. I mean, you, you're more than welcome to fight back, but I really like this pick. That, that, that makes cards like Throws of Chaos <laughs> yeah. super powerful because literally all that card does is Cascade and you can retrace it from your graveyard. I really love the synergy actually now. So Scott and Emma too, we appreciate both members of the BM cast. Uh, but yes, this is, a, this, is a great, this is a great, great find. I, I love this. 
Yeah, this is fun stuff. Thank you so much, listeners. Let's now get out of Challenge the Stats and into our next part of the topic where we're talking about those powerhouse commons. And specifically here, what we're going to do is just talk about our favorites. Like we talked about the most popular ones already, but now let's talk about the ones that we ourselves are playing in our decks, the ones that really shine in the decks that we play, in the games where we draw them. We're like, oh man, I'm so glad I got these. Dana, Hop to it, man. What is one of your favorite commons that you play and how much work is it doing for you in those games of EDH? Um, I, I'll mention one that I have in two different decks and that's Thoughtcast. Um, I love really efficient draw spells that just get me a couple cards. Um, I have Thought de- Cast in my Vela, the Nightclad Artifact deck, and in my SCR and Arden Equipment deck, decks that have just a ton of artifacts in the list. So Thought Cast being four and blue um, to draw two cards doesn't sound efficient until you realize it has affinity for artifacts. <laughs> so it costs one the less for each artifact you control, which means 99% of the time it's a one mana draw two. That's about as efficient as you can get in Magic to draw two cards. I, I just love Thoughtcast. Um, I think you probably need to be playing a very artifact-centric deck to want to run it. I don't think you can, you want to run it and just hope that you happen to have a bunch of mana rocks out. But <laughs> in an artifact deck, you just should be running Thoughtcast. It's a crazy efficient card. And I am always happy to see it in either of those two lists. Well, Dana, I feel like you're kind of the master of those like cheap, efficient draw spells. Like Knight's Whisper technically has a printing at common, and that's another favorite of yours to draw two, lose two life. You also love Winged Words, which is a three mana draw two. But if you control a flying creature, you'll draw two cards. Like you seem to really have an affinity for uh, those types of spells. Do you cost one less for each of these spells that you run? I I definitely should, I think. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I just love those, those really efficient common or, or even uncommon in the case of like, say, chart a course or expressive iteration, um, just really efficient spells that are, you know, two mana or in this case, less than that, if, if you have a few artifacts out <laughs> that just get me cards ahead. It's just, those are my favorite kind of spells for running decks. And this is one of my favorites in the common slot. Well, there's one that's in the common slot that all three of us actually have had a whole lot of luck with. That's definitely village rights. Yeah. One mana for mm. instant. It's a, it's a common as additional cost, you sacrifice a creature and you just draw two cards. We all, for various reasons, each of us have our own motivations for sacrificing creatures, but being able to draw <laughs> two cards at instant speed, um, say you're responding to somebody's removal spell and you just want to get some value out of it, there's all sorts of reasons you want to be playing Village Rights, even if you're not playing an Aristocrats deck. It's such a flexible, powerful card. I absolutely love this. Well, and, and Matt, you specifically are using village rights in like one of your decks, Ukima and Kazer. Mm-hmm. And Ukima is that whale wolf that gets a bunch of counters onto it. And when it leaves the battlefield, it domes someone equal to its power. So you're not just using village rights as a simple way of getting some cards. You will literally use village rights as a kill condition in that deck. It's amazing. As a kill spell, yes. Uh, it's 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 just great. It's super powerful. My Ukima and Kazer deck actually has a fair amount of commons and uncommons, whether uh, it's Snakeskin Veil to protect any of my important cards. Mm. Uh, Teferi's Time Twist, I've killed Sheldon Menery with, which is one of my favorite <laughs> memories in all of Magic because it's just a great way to flicker anything important, saves it from a from a kill spell, uh, brings it back with a plus one, plus one counter. But also stuff like Bioshift, that's just a fun combat trick. Mm. It's not quite as powerful as the Ozolith, but Bioshift is just a great way at instant speed to shift all your plus one plus one counters onto a different creature uh it's just a great efficient card i I feel like not quite as powerful as the ozolith is maybe something you can apply to (laughs) most cards in magic but yes i get what i get your point that that's that's very true that's fair that's fair and this next skin veil is actually really awesome too because that like is a one mana give a creature hexproof and put a counter on it and like that's right up your alley in that deck that's perfect that that enables the strategy and protects the thing that is most core to your strategy like just for a little common that's a lot of work yeah, there, there's a lot of just common cards that do a lot of work. Scale the Heights actually is one that is, has impressed me a lot because it does so many different things that you just want to be doing in general. So not only does Scale the Heights put a plus one, plus one count on a creature, you gain two life, you get to draw a card, and you play an additional land. That's a lot of value for three mana. And that's just one of the reasons I think that's just such a fantastic common card. There's, If you're playing any given theme, chances are you've got at least 50 <laughs> fairly powerful commons that are going to synergize very well with that theme. And that's why I like giving a lot of decks a certain theme because it opens you up to a lot to making room for a lot of these commons and uncommons. Very, very much. 
Um, to move to some examples from mine that I like, these are genuinely again like win conditions for my deck. Y'all know me. Y'all know that my my love in the game is Sir Conrad the Grim. He's my boy. I love him so so much. And two of, if not three of, the most powerful cards that I could be playing in that deck are the cards Grave Purge. Footbottom Feast, and another one called Forever Young. All three of those are just little commons, some of them instant, some of them at sorcery speed, that take any number of creature cards from your graveyard and put them on top of your library. And then you'll also draw a card. And with Sir Conrad's ability, seeing a bunch of things leave the graveyard, he'll deal a ton of damage to my opponents. And then he'll put those, like all those cards are going back on top of my library where I can then use Conrad's activated ability to continue to mill myself and then make my opponents get even more damage dealt to them as I am putting creatures directly from my library back into the graveyard. Those are three of the most exciting cards that I could draw in that deck. And they're just little comments and they're they're seriously just such amazing, fantastic stuff. I hope you guys are scared when you see those because it just, it feels so hilarious to kill someone with a card called Foot Bottom Feast. I mean, I really like that you're putting in Rod Stewart songs into your decks with Forever Young. Uh, that's also very <laughs> impressive. I thought there was a card called Maggie May he had in here, but um, Forever Young, that's a good catch, Matt. <laughs> wow. Okay. There, there's, there's a lot of double use. Well, another card, too, that I know Dana has had a lot of luck with, and it's done very well for me and my, my Alibu deck specifically, and also my Valduck deck just for the, the card selection, Unexpected Windfall. That's another one of those just great new red looting spells there's a lot of impulse draw that you're seeing lately but unexpected windfall for four a two red red for an instant as an additional cost to cast a spell you discard a card and then you draw two cards and create two treasure tokens that's just a fantastic great way it boils down to effectively two mana because you get to create those treasures but there's a lot of cards kind of in that realm where you're getting some card selection you're evening things out you're just getting some some good draws I I love all these types of cards that they've been printing lately. And Unexpected Windfall is one of those that just, it's helped every single red deck that I've put the card in. What works really well about Unexpected Windfall is there's a bunch of things baked into that card that you kind of don't realize until you play it. Y yeah, it's an impulse draw for, for, two, for four mana, um, but... It, th those spells are going to hit your landfall or, or give you something that you can use. Those treasures are creating artifact ETB triggers, which in artifact decks is oftentimes relevant. There's plenty of things that, you know, put a plus one counter on this creature whenever an artifact comes into play or what have you. It's creating two treasures, which are going to add to the amount of artifacts you have in play. And there's decks that care about that. <laughs> um, it's going to give you the ability to sacrifice those artifacts and generate two sacrifice triggers, which is a big deal sometimes in some decks. There's just a whole bunch of things on that one card, once you really kind of think about it, that are relevant to a bunch of decks. And you don't need all of them, but there are some decks that care about all of them. So like sometimes these cards become really, really powerful in the right deck. Well, and Dana, specifically, you have a jury master of the review deck. Like you just talked there about caring about sacrifice. Right. That's one of those decks where a lot of some, like some of the most powerhouse cards that you are playing in that deck are indeed little commons that incidentally make a bunch of sacrificable artifacts. Unexpected Windfall is one of them. Seize the Spoils is another. Deadly Dispute is amazing. Matt, you had praised a, a sacrifice to draw a card earlier. Well, Deadly Dispute lets you sacrifice a creature or a treasure. You draw two cards and you replace the treasure that's incredible and dana again speaking of like the you know matt sacrifices his creatures to dome someone with a bunch of damage you're doing the same thing with your jury deck and it's incredible uh, impulsive pilfer is enough another one in that deck it's it's a one mana goblin pirate that's a one one and when it dies it creates a treasure token but it has encore for three and a red so you can encore it when it's in your graveyard and make token copies that attack each opponent. Um, well, again, that's that's a one mana common spell that that <laughs> when it dies makes you a treasure. That's you know doing the same thing. It's a it's a artifact ETB. It's a sacrifice effect. Then you're making three copies of that, which <laughs> all have the same thing again. They're all giving you triggers when they die. They're all giving you treasure triggers, which are all giving you sacrifice triggers. That's a insane amount of value on one common in that particular deck. And there's plenty of decks like that that want all of those things. Yeah, if, if you want any, I mean, really any looting effect, 
you're, you're probably looking at a lot of common cards. My Riel deck, for example, loves discarding cards because of Riel's ability. <laughs> so I have cards like Tormenting Voice, Cathartic Reunion, where you get to add as an additional cost to that spell. You discard you know, a card or two, and then you just get to draw a bunch of cards. <laughs> that, those are just such fantastic things. If you like having a certain card type in your graveyard, maybe you're playing an artifact deck like uh, uh, Bosch, Iron Golem, or, or Duretti. You can just use these to put artifacts into your graveyard, draw some new cards because you have access to your graveyard with those types of decks. This, they're just great, great effects. There's so many good ways for red to be able to cycle through. And I, now that we're talking about it, red has a lot of great card selection spells in this common slot that just you're, you're looking at 10, 20 cent cards and you can just get a great, great amount of value for your deck. Well, and hey, Matt, you were just talking about Riel there and I know your love of combat tricks extends to Riel as well, and you, sir, are playing a teamer battle rage in that deck, I am. aren't you? The two mana red instant to give a creature double strike and trample if it has enough power, and Riel is like, yeah, I've got enough power, let's be lethal. Uh, I, I believe you also run Teamer Battle Rage in your Feather deck as well, though, Joseph. So don't act like I'm the madman, because you <laughs> oh, also no. have done some some absolutely silly things with Teamer Battle Rage. Oh, yeah. Feather is basically an oops all commons type of deck. Runs plenty yeah. of them for sure. Uh, so, yeah, I oh I could spend the rest of the episode talking about uh, Feather and all of the protective instants and combat tricks and stuff like that. But I instead, actually, let's flip over to uh, I I'd rather since since you guys have those cards that dome enemies for however big your creatures are. Let me highlight two of my favorite commons in my Rehan and Ishai deck, which is a deck that puts so many plus one counters onto things that they just get absolutely huge. I love playing Essence Harvest and Rite of Consumption, which are basically almost like Black's version of the red card Fling. So Rite of Consumption will sacrifice one of your creatures and then target opponent will lose life and you'll gain life equal to the sacrificed creature's power. Or Essence Harvest is three mana and just target opponent loses life equal to the greatest power among your creatures and you gain that much life. These are incredible. Even if your creature is just a 10-10 or something, that is a substantive life swing. But if your creature is like a 30-30, which as you probably know can happen really easily in plus one counter decks, especially when one of your commanders is growing bigger and bigger every time anyone plays a spell. Yeah, I love these cards. They are easily, like I, I am actively searching to find those cards every time that I am playing that deck. I want to draw them so bad so that I can find a new way to close things out that doesn't just involve combat. Well, if you want to talk about commons that are going to turn into win conditions, then I know Dana has a Crush the Blood Braided deck that gets a lot of plus one, plus one counters onto <laughs> one specific creature. And Fling is a common that turns into a win condition because when that Crush gets big enough or whatever that creature is, you can fling a creature at somebody's face because you sacrifice creature as an additional cost to cast fling, and then it deals damage equal to that sacrificed creature's power to target creature or player. So it turns out doming somebody for 40 with a crush because of fling is pretty good. Pretty good. It also turns out that a bunch of those fling-esque effects are also commons. You know, Souls Fire, <laughs> Gravitic Punch, Essence Harvest, Right of Consumption. Um, a lot of those things just are, are commons because they're maybe not that amazing in a limited environment or in standard, but in Commander right. where you're, it's not that difficult to get a 30-30 in place sometimes they're much more they're much more powerful very much hey uh matt actually talk to me about your valduk deck we've talked a lot about going tall but um i, th I can think of a common enchantment that you're playing in valduk that goes wide rather than tall well it does you're absolutely right and in addition to a lot of the cards that we've already talked about whether it's uh some of the looting effects like tormenting voice or anything like that um yes there's one enchantment that i absolutely love that is a win condition in this deck it's basically a baby perforos god of the forge effect uh impact tremors is wildly powerful folks so with impact tremors you're able to have each creature enter the battlefield and deal one damage to each opponent which is one of those very very powerful effects that we talk about where it's not just target opponent it's each opponent so five elementals come into play with valdux enters or go to combat ability you're able to deal 15 total damage because it's five from each creature to each opponent <laughs> it's so so good uh i just i love it and that's without even going to combat <laughs> right. i can still attack and i probably will right but you don't even have to attack with impact tremors it's just half a perforos for half the price still powerful it, it's so good heck as long as you're talking about red and we're talking about things that scale really well to commander mana geyser five mana red sorcery add a red mana for each tapped land your opponent's control 
I can't remember the last time that I've seen a mana geyser that was cast that gave someone less than 15 mana. That usually is going to be like a boom, now I've got 25 red mana in my mana pool. Get ready, the storm count is at one. You know, like that is an amazing red card. Well, we talked about a lot of the the hidden power in in, in the blue commons, but um, you know, they print counter spells in every single set in blue. And some of the common ones wind up being very good in other decks. Abjure, for one, for example, is one I run in a couple different decks because mm. it's a one-mana counterspell. Um, requires you to sacrifice a blue permanent, but there are some decks that just have a surplus of blue permanents that are always available. My Talran Sky Summoner deck being one. <laughs> um, so it gives you the ability to just hard counter a spell for a single blue mana. And in that case, it's going to replace the permanent you're sacrificing anyway. Um, so that's one that I really like. I run it in my Edrix by Master of Trust deck as well, because I don't mind giving up a flying man to use a one mana counter spell. Um, so yeah, th that's a place I think things like Muddle the Mixture are also really good Ooh. common counters that you find in blue. Um, another one that I have in a couple different decks because it can be a tutor as well. So there's a lot of stuff in blue, I think, um, that has some hidden power. Another two uh, hidden strings and hands of binding that have the cipher ability because cipher works as a cast trigger. So they're cheap common spells that do semi useful things that also generate double cast. So you put them on a thing, swing through, cast it again. So you get double the effect basically the first turn you cast it if you have a creature available as well as double cast triggers and decks that care about that kind of thing. Yeah, you've made a bunch of drakes with your Talrand deck because of the Cypher stuff that you're up to. Mm -hmm. those, uh, those are some nasty pieces of tech, dude. I, I I mean, I love it, though. Like, those are genuinely things that are, like, fueling the entire rest of the deck. They're not just greasing the wheels, even. Like, the entire strategy is humming because of them, you know? Yeah, it, it also, it's fun finding those cards, too. Like, it's <laughs> it's not that it isn't enjoyable beating someone in the face with a Sun Titan, because Sun Titan's a great card. But it's also fun finding those weird, useful commons that work really well in your deck because it feels like you've discovered a cool thing. I, I like doing that a lot for sure. And as long as we're talking about blue, I'll shout out one of my favorite cards in my entire Will Helt deck right now is Repository Scob. So Will Helt is zombie tribal and Repository Scob completely flew under my radar when I first was looking over the Crimson Vow and Midnight Hunt stuff. It's a three mana, excuse me, a four mana, three, three blue zombie that can exploit itself so you can sacrifice it or sacrifice another creature when it enters the battlefield to get back a spell from your graveyard to your hand. This has instantly become one of my favorite zombies to ever draw in that deck because if I play a zombie apocalypse which will bring all of my zombies back from the grave and then I use the repository scob to get that zombie apocalypse back to my hand no one's gonna be able to kill my stuff like my zombies are here to stay and that is just a little common that does so much more work than I, I thought it would even when I put it into the deck and I nearly missed it because it was a common and that's not fair to the common because it's such a good card so yeah tons of powerhouses here Right. But also, you know, let's not just linger on blue. Let's go back to green. Matt, I'm sure you'll love us talking about some favorite green common cards here. Uh, uh, actually, then again, maybe you won't love me bringing up this one. Um, because y'all know that when I play my Marin of Clan Naltoth deck, one of the core cards in the deck is Spore Frog, which I can sacrifice to fog the combat and constantly get back with Marin. Probably one of the most annoying common cards ever printed, if I'm being perfectly honest. So uh, yeah, green also does plenty of great stuff at the common level, as we've seen before, but this one is especially a nuisance. Yes, can, can confirm that uh, Spore Frog is quite the obnoxious toolbox type of card. <laughs> Well, uh, so what about instead, uh, if that one is not to your liking, Matt, although for the record, it's amazing synergy. Um, what about a card that I've challenged plenty of times uh, on the show, Stone Cedar Hierophant? This is a landfall card that is just a common that I do not think people are playing enough in their landfall decks. It's a four mana one one that can tap to untap one of your lands. And then it has a basically a landfall trigger. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you can untap the Stone Cedar Hierophant. This card's amazing. It is basically a common version of Lotus Cobra. It costs a couple more mana, it's true, but it can also untap bigger and bigger lands that give you more than just one mana. This card is a 
powerhouse for me in my Titania deck. I love this card so much. Green's got it going on here. Stone Cedar Hierophant, play it, play it, play it. Yeah, if you're playing any sort of landfall deck, Stone Cedar Hierophant is, is a fantastic common. Uh, one other common I think also gets slotted into not enough decks, Colony Hearts Expedition. <laughs> it's just an enchantment for one and a green with landfall. So whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you can put a quest counter on Colony Heart Expedition. And then at any time, you don't need to do it at a specific time, you can just remove three quest counters from Colony Heart Expedition and sacrifice it. And you search your library up to, for up to two basic land cards, put them on the battlefield, tapped and shuffle your library. So if you need in an Omnath Locus of Rage deck, for example, hmm? two surprise blockers, you can just have this sitting around as one of those infamous Matt Morgan on the board combat tricks to <laughs> pump out two landfall triggers whenever you need it. Uh, it's fantastic common. If you, Landfall decks actually, I think, have such a great way to play a load of commons, uh, whether it's Broken Bond as a great way to get rid of a pesky artifact or enchantment Ooh. and also get another landfall trigger. Uh, there's so many good things going on in this, this common slot with ramp. We already talked about how green ramps so well, but we didn't even cover some of the great ones like ramp into growth or Nissa's pilgrimage either that are still fantastic ramp spells if you can't find a cultivate laying around your collection. And heck, when we're talking about green, I mean, Dano, I feel like another one of your signature cards here is a common Lignify. I love Lignify. It, it's one of those spells that just turns off a commander, maybe permanently if the person doesn't have a sacrifice outlet or a way to remove an enchantment. <laughs> um, some, some commanders, you just need to remove them from the board for good, and things like Lignify are a way to do that. And while we did talk about the lack of really good white commons, I do think it's worth noting that all three of White's good counter spells, Ooh. Dawn Charm, Lapse of Certainty, and Manatithe, were originally printed at Common. Yes, those are good. Lapse of Certainty, especially. I've been completely blown out by all three of these. Uh, that's a really great pick. I, I love that. Lapse of Certainty, people really don't see it coming. And hey, if you're playing like a deck that has a Sunforger, all three of those are going to be amazing to go and get super big surprises that will make you feel very, very safe if you have a Sunforger attached to a creature. But even if you don't, those are actually really solid. Those should see more play. Mm -hmm. Those should be more popular than Oblivion Ring. Those should <laughs> put these cards into your decks. Yeah, Lapse of Certainty, especially being just a hard counter. Um, yes, they get the card back, but like there's plenty of times that just saves you from losing the game. Um, I'm a big fan of that spell for sure. Yeah. And hey, I'll throw out one more favorite white common here as well. And that's the card Fanatical Devotion. Y'all know me. Y'all know I love my sacrifice outlets to get a bunch of aristocrats triggers. Fanatical Devotion. I think we've challenged the stats on this card before. It's a three mana white enchantment where you can sacrifice a creature to regenerate target creature. And I just love having like uh, this card could say sacrifice a creature, do nothing. And I would still love it. But it is great protection. And I just love being able to sacrifice my creatures at will in case someone's trying to steal them or exile them or I just want to have one of those creatures leave the battlefield to do a whole bunch of damage on its way out or just a bunch of aristocrats triggers I love fanatical devotion to see that white does have good comments we people just need to play them more these cards are amazing folks we need to we need to play more of these these are great cards fanatical devotion is a very good card that I think I've forgotten about more times than I've remembered it <laughs> uh, I mean obviously otherwise I'd have it in more decks but it, it's great if you're if there's a valuable target that you have laying around and you have a less valuable target it. It's a great way to just swap them. There you go. There you go. Oh, man. It's a, yeah, this is this is a really fun episode. Matt, thank you so much for challenging the stats on so many cards, like the Reckless Impulses that we've seen over the years, like the Defiles, all of those. Um, I, I think it's just so important to always remember to look out for these cards that might be greasing the wheels a whole lot. They might be the thing that makes the strategy work, or they might sometimes even be your win conditions. This is a really fun episode. And uh, so, Matt, thank you so much for constantly keeping these at our attention because we don't well, want to overlook them. You you're very welcome. I didn't want to deprive everybody of, of a bad topic for once, which is actually, folks, that's another fantastic common counterspell. Deprive. Pick deprive. it up. <laughs> Well, well done there. Listeners, we would love to hear from you about what your favorite commons are in your EDH decks. Which ones are you playing that just deal a whole bunch of just amazing stuff? Even though they are just a common, sometimes they might be better than your rares. They are definitely worth investigating. But with that, we are going to officially call this episode to a close. So fellas, if our listeners would like to get in touch with us, where is it that they can find us all? Matt? 
So you can find me on the Twitters, at Mathemus55, that's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And don't forget, Wednesday evenings, we are streaming over at twitch.tv slash edhretcast. We have fantastic guests on every single week, and it's always a super fun time, so make sure you tune in for all the great games. And Dana. You can find me on the Twitterbirds, at Dana Roach. You can hear me once a week on my other podcast, CMDR Central. I am writing articles for EDH Rec and Commander's Herald, and you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash edhretcast. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz on Twitter, and you can find the cast at EDH Retcast on Facebook and on Twitter. Plus, if you've got a question, you can contact us at EDHRetcast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out one last time to the folks at the Command Zone. Ashlyn Rose, Damon Lenz, Lady Danger, Josh Murphy, Craig Blanchett, Jake Boss, Truck Tie, uh, just a bunch of folks at the terrific Command Zone office. Holy crap, they have so many amazing people working here. And of course, Josh Lee Kwai. Thank y'all for everything, and thanks so much to Chase at Mana Curves for helping us out with post-production moving forward on the show we are so lucky to have you finally of course we also want to thank our sponsors for the show tcg player and cardkingdom.com plus you can visit altersleeves.com slash edhretcast for cool custom edhrex sleeves listeners we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights but until then remember edh wreck your deck before you wreck your deck (laughs) 